Welcome to Modern Church History. My name is Nathan Brummel and I hope you're having a great day. Today in Modern Church History, we take a sixth look at the life of Hermann Bavik, the great Dutch Reformed systematic theologian. We have traced his childhood, we've gone through his education. Last time we looked at the fact that when he was a professor at Kampen, the Lord in his province did finally give to him a wife, Johanna Skippers. Today what we do is we pick up on his time in Kampen, and we want to talk about some of the big issues that he faced during that time. There were also two attempts to lure him away from there. And it's interesting that, that at this period of time, Bavink actually considers going to the Free University and also, even more startling, considers the idea of becoming a professor at his alma mater, Leiden University. And this time period also concludes with Bavink finishing a very successful and fruitful time of teaching at Kampen, where he had developed a very good relationship with his students and had been very productive as a theological writer. Now, as our story begins, the year is 1889, and at that time, Abraham Kuyper tried it again. This is now the third attempt to entice Bavink to come and teach at the Free University. At this point, now the Dolianci churches have come into existence. They have left the Dutch Reformed State Church, but at this point, we have two separate confessional churches in the Netherlands. You have the Succeeder churches, and then now you have also the Dolianci churches. Kuiper is looking for a unification of the two denominations, and Bavink also supports that as well. So Bavink rightly came to realize that if he left Kampen for the free university at this time, he could hinder an eventual union between the two denominations. And his students didn't want him to leave either. When his students at Kampen learned that he had received an appointment to the free university, 89 of the students, the majority, wrote a public letter asking him to stay. Edzard van Dalen, who later on would write a church order commentary, paints a portrait of what the relationship was at this time between Bavink and his students. And there was a lot of camaraderie, a very positive working relationship between Bavink and his students. He says, For three years we studied dogmatics with Bavink. His classes met in the morning. Before he began his lecture, usually at 9 a.m., he stood near the stove and we gathered around him and asked him questions. We touched upon all kinds of subjects, an article by Dr. Kuiper, a novel that had appeared recently in one of the modern languages, socialism, psychology, anything. And when he answered us, he proved to be well informed, and usually he placed the subject in the light of the great principles of the Word of God. Then we were treated to a brief improvisation and learned much. After that, glancing at his watch, he would say, Gentlemen, it's time to begin, that he led us in a prayer and lectured on dogmatics. He spoke in such a way that we often forgot to take notes as we were supposed to do. He had not published his dogmatics as yet. And just listened to his enthusiastic presentation of the subject. Eglinton provides us with a translation of that quote there. So Bavink had a very positive relationship with his students. But even when he said no to the appointment from the Free University, it's very interesting that he let people know that he wasn't against the concept of a Christian university. In fact, he liked the fact that in a university, the Word of God would be brought to bear on every domain of life. And it's very interesting that Bavink was very much like the medievals. He thought that theology should be the queen of the sciences. Not where he was right now in Kampen. He not only was isolated from kind of the leading cultural contexts found in Amsterdam, which is to the west across the body of water. He was in sort of an out-of-the-way provincial town, but also, of course, in a seminary. It's not like you have scientists who are working with you on issues of Christ and culture or whatever they might be. So Bavink let people know that he loved the idea of theology functioning in this role, that is, as a queen of the sciences within a Christian university. 
And so Bob recognized the benefits of teaching in a university where he could develop the concept of the Lordship of Jesus Christ in every single sphere. And when the students at Compton learned that their favorite professor was staying, they celebrated by putting out flags and hanging them outside of their windows. It was like a public celebration. Now, at the same time, something striking happened, which is that a chair became vacant at Leiden University. And what is, what is amazing to me is that in a letter to his friend Christian Hergranya, Bavik even expressed interest in teaching at his alma mater, which was a place where every kind of apostate and liberal theology was being taught. Now, that would have shocked his friends in the succession churches if they'd known about it. But Bavink expressed confidentially the thought that teaching at a place like Leiden would give him academic freedom to confirm one's own convictions scientifically and share them with others. So he thought that it would give him an opportunity to engage in rigorous thought with people who didn't agree with him. Bavink learned that someone else had received the appointment and Eglinton says that Bavink learned that he couldn't rise above a glass ceiling. And so that door was closed. Probably, thankfully, it would have been sad if Bavink would have been tempted to go in that direction. Now, as the year 1892 comes, the hopes of both Bavink and Kuiper came true. The succession churches and the Doliancy churches were united to form the Herofamerde Kerken in Nederland, the Reformed churches in the Netherlands. The year was 1892. So in 1886, the Doliancy had been formed, and then a few years later, in 1892, the two churches are now one. So now you have people from Hendrik de Kock's tradition of the succession, now in the same denomination with Abraham Kuyper, who has just led this recent group out of the Dutch Reformed State Church. The result is that they have a new denomination that numbers around 370,000 members with 700 churches. Unfortunately, the burning issue that had not been settled was the issue of ministerial training. The two denominations were united, but then it didn't always feel that way on the ground. The strange thing is that in many towns or cities in the Netherlands, there were churches who were from the succession heritage, and then across town, or even across the street maybe, there would be a Doliancy congregation from that background. The Doliancy churches, remember, had only recently left the state church. And so it's interesting that the people in this united church were all very aware of their identity. And so the churches that had come from the succeeder tradition were called the A churches, whereas the Doliancy ones, which had come out later, were called the B churches. And if you'd visit a specific town in the Netherlands, the members of the two different churches would be very, very aware of their respective distinctives. Within the A churches, there might be certain ideas about covenant or other matters that would be a big deal to them, and you'd find the same thing in the B churches. And if you were an A church, you probably would call a graduate from the Succeeder Seminary in Compton. But if a B church was vacant, on the other hand, they would look for a graduate from the Free University in Amsterdam. And then the A churches were skeptical of the piety of the B churches. The B churches thought that the A churches engaged in world flight. And so there was tension. Now, the A churches looked to Bavink and the prophets at Compton for theological leadership. In the B churches, instead, they looked to Kuiper and his colleagues at the Free University for theological, educational, and then even political leadership. Well, Herman Bavink realized that if they couldn't unite the theological schools, there would continue to be this division in the new denomination. And so he considered it very important, a very important project to try to bring about the unification of Kampen and then the theological school at the Free University. Meanwhile, Lucas Lindebaum, his colleague and other succeeders, thought it was wrong for the B churches to provide ministerial training 
at the free university since it wasn't under church control. And Linda Bohm and others rejected Kuiper's view that theology could be studied as a science at a university in a context where the Synod of a Church didn't have oversight. Linda Bohm thought, by viewing theology as an independent science, they, he meant Kuiper and Bavik, were secularizing it and would eventually leave it a hollowed out shell. That's a quote that Eglinton provides for us on page 20 in his book. And so Bavink felt the challenge here, and he wanted to provide some type of middle way between the concerns of the A churches and the B churches so that they could come up with some type of compromise that allowed for a unified theological school. Meanwhile, Linda Bohm thought that Bavink's Compromise ideas would bastardize rather than improve the training of ministers. Well, scarcely had the two denominations been united that in 1893, Abraham Kuyper was at it again. Now, for a fourth time, in a sensitive context, he tries once again to lure Bavink over to the Free University. Now, he should have known better than doing this in 1892 because the churches had just united and the issue of theological education had not been solved. Kuiper should have been realized that if Bavink had transferred over to the Free University, Bavink, who was the leading advocate for unification of the theological schools, in Compen and in the Succeeder tradition would therefore lose his influence in Compen, and therefore people who were against something like that would, would become uh, the leading voice in the A churches. But nevertheless, Kuiper tried for fourth time to try to lure Bavink to come. Now at this time, Bavink was just beginning to make progress with his reformed dogmatics. He had been active in writing volume one on prolegomena, and he was about to begin his work on volumes two, three, and four. And so he's just about ready to write what will be his groundbreaking work on systematic theology. And here comes Abraham Kuyper, and of all things, he says, I wanna point you to be a professor of Old Testament at the Free University. He had tried to lure people from America, like Gerhardus Voss, to come and teach at the Free University. And now, he thought that Bavink was the most gifted person he could think of in the Dutch context to teach Old Testament. Well, this would have been, in some sense, a tragedy because it would have meant the end of Bavink's work in systematic theology. And what's amazing to me is that he almost tempted Bavink to give up teaching dogmatics, that is systematic theology, so that his main work would never have been written. Eglinton talks about how if Bavink had done this and changed to Old Testament, that would have been a breathtaking change in direction, he says, and that certainly would have been. Bavink discusses, you know, whether he's young enough to try to suddenly plunge into Old Testament research instead, and he says, well, if I knew someone who could be a, you know, a better teacher in Old Testament, you know, I would right away back out, but he, he didn't think there was anyone like that. But finally, Bavink recognized that that wasn't the smart thing to do. And he should have understood from the very outset, of course, that if he at this point would have transferred to the free university, that would have been the end of trying to unify ministerial training in the United Church. So he finally decided to remain in Compton, where he showed very strong support for a plan to unite the two schools. Eglinton writes, that uh, Bavink aimed at an ideal according to which the theological school would become a seminary attached to the theological faculty within the free university. In other words, he was looking for a plan that would satisfy the A churches by saying that now a unified theological school will be under the oversight of the denominational synod. 
on the other hand, he's also trying to deal with the fact that the people connected to the free university, of course, want to continue to have some type of influence over the nature of the school or its location. So in 1899, he sent a plan to the Groningen Synod that involved this. In order to kind of, you know, play to the B churches, that is Kuiper's group, which have their university in Amsterdam, he thought the theological school could relocate from Kampen to a small city that was, however, a suburb of Amsterdam. He thought that plan would show the supporters in Kampen, too, that it's not like the professors from Kampen are just going to all move into the free university and just join with the faculty there. It would remain a distinct school. So basically, the professors of theology at the free university would relocate or at least teach now in this other location so that therefore the the succession churches could say, well, we still have a distinct seminary and it's distinct from the university. And so Bobbink put forward this plan. So the theological school would be also in a better location. It would be in the thick of things, really. The faculty and students could also be in close proximity to the free university, so the theologians could interact with the scholars at the free university. And he thought that the people connected to Kuiper's group would be happy that their ministerial training would remain in the Amsterdam area. So that was a benefit for the B churches. So Bobbing thought that this was a fair, balanced proposal that would still retain the identity of the theological school as a churchly school overseen by the Synod for ministerial training. But the plan failed to find approval. And then in 1902, Bobbing makes a last important attempt to bring about this unification. He put together a proposal to the General Synod. And James Eglinton explains the proposal. The church-oriented theological school and the free university's theological faculty should be united into a single institution that would train theologians for the church and the academy. So notice what's going on. The theological school will be, once again, distinct from the free university. It would be moved to a suburb of Amsterdam. It would be overseen by the Synod. And yet the point is that the training would happen there not only for ministerial students, but also for people who wanted more of an academic study of theology. Maybe they wanted to uh, go on to teach, you know, theology at the college level or something like that. And the amazing thing is that at this time, Bavik's proposal received a majority of votes. It passed. So that moment, if Bavink had heard about it, he wasn't actually right there, I don't think, when it passed. But therefore, his hopes had been realized. But then suddenly, this success was hijacked by the tyranny of a minority. Some members of the A churches, that is the old Succeeder church, threatened a church split. A minority at the Synod who didn't want this unification of theological schools to happen, even though many of their concerns had been dealt with, they so intimidated the majority that the Synod quickly made a second decision that, well, we will not implement our previous decision. So they voted to unify the theological schools, and then they vote that they won't implement that decision. Basically what happens is that some of these sectarian people, these people who didn't want a unification of the theological schools, threatened a church split. They said things on the floor of Senate like, you know, if, if the Synod moves ahead with carrying this out, then the worst fears of the denomination would be realized. And the majority understood exactly what was being threatened which was a split, that is, the people among the succeeder tradition in the A churches would lead a movement out of the United Church. Bobbing publicly responded to this. Eglinton explains what he said. 
He says, Bobbing's reply came in a lengthy editorial accusing the church of giving itself over to the tyranny of the minority. The consequence of the synod's backtracking, he argued, was that the theological school could no longer claim to represent the Reformed churches in the Netherlands, but rather had become a niche institution catering only to a minority group within it. It was a damning verdict. So Bavink is saying that there's this small group within the Afskiding tradition, a minority that is exercising tyranny, trying to somehow protect the succeeder, seminary, and compen. And therefore, in some sense, the theological school doesn't belong to the denomination as the whole. The denomination as a whole is not making decisions now. It's a minority that are trying to intimidate the majority into going along with whatever they want. And then Bavink wrote a little book, and really this little book was the writing on the wall about the fact that, no, he would be going now from Compen. The title of the book was Staying or Going? A Question and an Answer. And in that book, he basically burned his bridges to staying in Compen. He, he said that if uh, the tyranny of the minority continues, that he and a fellow faculty member would simply resign from Compen and accept appointments at the Free University. In other words, they would lead by way of their own conduct. In person, Bobbink would attempt to unify Compen and Amsterdam. He would take himself and one of the other leading popular professors and they would transfer to the Free University and that way they would actually play a role in bringing the two institutions together. Now, unspoken here is what would also happen with the student body at Compen. Perhaps the student body, or at least a part of it, would also join him in Amsterdam. And then he expressed that he hoped that in the near future, the entire theological school in Compen would follow his lead. Well, then the result would be a united seminary. Well, when the members of the eight churches who had been so vocal against the unification of the theological schools now realized what Bavink would do, they were scared and angry. Lindebaum, for example, was angry. Not that Bavink might leave Compen, but scared and angry because he feared that many of the students in Compen would transfer to Amsterdam. And Lucas Lindebaum had reason to fear that result. Bavink was far more popular than he among the students. In fact, when Compen had faced losing Bavink in the past, they had lobbied him to stay. And then within the same period of time, a church had extended a call to Lucas Lindebaum. And in his Dach book, Bavink ironically mentions the fact that the students at Compton had not lobbied Lindebaum to stay. But Lindebaum's worst fears would come true. He had sowed the wind and now he would reap the whirlwind. Now that little book and its publication really had burned bridges. It was now time for him to go. So. Very soon, Bavink began talks with the Free University about him receiving an appointment and the nature of his salary. And he accepted an appointment to the Free University along with one of his colleagues. Bavink then, as it was time for him to leave, had a talk with his students at Compen. He talked about his love for the theological school he talked about how he had inclinations to teach in a seminary rather than at a university, which is interesting. He also emphasized his succession roots. You know, he was being tarred and feathered as somehow just a, you know, a follower of Kuiper or something. He said, I said before and now I say it again. I am a child of the succession and I hope to remain so. Eglinton records that and um, you can see how that's the sort of thing that would have reverberated with his succeeder students. And so Bavink and his colleague Biesterfeld both accepted appointments at the Free University. So the supporters of the eight churches had lobbied so hard against the unification of ministerial training. A minority had exercised tyranny over a synod majority, and now that minority enjoyed the bitter fruit of their schismatic behavior. A full 50% of the students at Compen 
followed Bonken, Bobink, and Beasterfield to Amsterdam. So Lucas Lindeboom lost half of his students. Eglinton writes, this mass departure was nothing less than a disaster for the school on page 216 in his biography. So you can only imagine how controversial this was. What men like Linda Bohm and other people who had been so critical of Bavik, what they thought now. The leading star of their seminary had departed and half of the desks are sitting empty. The result, though, is that the Free University now combined theologians from both the Ofskiding and the Doliancy tradition, and they had this huge influx of students who were from the Succeder tradition. So Bavink didn't actually lose half of his students. He retained half of his students, even though he didn't try to lobby them to get them to leave. And even in the following year or so, there would be more students who would trickle from Compen to the Free University to study under Bavink. By this time, Bavink had completed the publication of his four-volume Reformed Dogmatics, which in Dutch was called Hervermeerde Dogmatique. And these volumes had come out between 1895 and 1901. The first had been on prolegomena, and then the second was on God and creation. The third was on sin and salvation, and then the fourth volume covered the Holy Spirit, the Church, and the new creation. During the next decade, while he was in Amsterdam, Bavink would continue to work on these documents, and he would revise these volumes in a second edition. But he had completed now his magnum opus before he left for Amsterdam. And this four-volume work would be translated into English in full only at the end of the uh, 20th century, or actually the first part of the 21st century. Baker Publishing in Grand Rapids, Michigan published the four volumes from 2003 to 2008. And Bavink would continue other theological work in Amsterdam. For example, he would write a single volume work on Christian theology to sort of simplify things for his readership. He would also revise his dogmatics, adding hundreds and hundreds of pages. And, and then, though, he would go beyond that, and he would begin to write on a wide array of issues, from psychology to politics to pedagogy. And his move there would open the way for him to carry out his hope and plan that Christian theology might function as the queen of the sciences and therefore direct studies at the Free University. And so he was excited about showing what the implications of the Christian faith were and, and the implications of Christian theology for the Lordship of Christ was with respect to all of the other disciplines at a Christian university. So Bavink has moved to Amsterdam. For him, that was the end of a long chapter in his life at the seminary in Kampen. He also had been through intense controversy there in great controversy with especially people from the succeeder tradition. And so for him, this also must have been a great relief. He was no longer in the context of Kampen, where, Kampen, where there was all this debate and controversy. He was now at the Free University. He was living in Amsterdam. And so it could be a time of peace and rest and really recovery from a very polemical time in his career. His work wasn't done. Next time, we will pick up on Bavink as a professor in Amsterdam. And then we're going to learn that there's more to the story. Not only is he going to be a popular speaker and lecturer, but he also is going to end up being a senator. Yes, he also is going to become a politically active person in the anti-revolutionary party, a chairman even of the Anti-Revolutionary Party, and then he will become a senator in the higher assembly in the Dutch government. Until then, farewell.